scriptures together in the book of the Psalms, Psalm 37. And we'll commence reading there at the verse number, verse number 10. Yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. They, yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword, they bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of an upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth, or he puts his arms around the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, for their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied, but the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. And God will, as he always does, bless his word to our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now we have been meditating upon this 37th Psalm, and the Lord has been showing us a number of things. Uh, the psalm opens with the psalmist's command, fret not thyself. Rather than fretting, the believer should have confidence in the Lord, cheerful in the Lord, commit his way on to the Lord, and find his consolation in the Lord. And then secondly, we noticed the psalmist's comparison or the psalmist contrast, and that's from verse 90, or verse number 9, down to verse 22. And that's the part that we're still in. And in the psalmist comparison, what the psalmist was doing is this, he was comparing or contrasting the righteous man and the unrighteous, the godly man and the ungodly. And he was drawing comparisons or he was drawing the contrast. Things that quite often, truthfully, we can't see because whenever we see, all we see is the prosperity of the ungodly man. And we don't see just what God sees. But God sees it all. And in our studies, we noticed that in this comparison or this contrast, there was the contrast in their destiny. That was the first thing, verses 9 to 11. And then verses 12 to 15 and verse 17 in their defense. Last Lord's Day, we were looking at the comparison in their deposits. Verse number 16, A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. And we were looking at that. And then from verse 18 to 22, I want you to notice that there is a comparison concerning their days. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. Comparison concerning their days. Now, verses 18 and 19, I want you to notice that it says this, The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied, but the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs, 
they shall consume into a smoke, shall they, into smoke shall they consume away. And you know, it is true, it says here, you'll notice, it says, the Lord knoweth the days of the upright, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine, they should be satisfied. Now, when we think about the evil time, when we think of the days of famine, we get honest, that's not an easy path. And therefore, we see once again, as the psalmist honorably reminds us over and over again, uh, that there are trials and there are troubles that the child of God has got to face, that we are not immune from trouble. Trouble is the common lot of every man. Think of Brother Job in the book of Job, chapter 5, verse 7. He says this under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. That's every man. In the 14th chapter of the book of Job, in verse number 1, Job once again reminds us, man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. And you know, it's amazing that so many of God's people, they think that somehow that, well, as a child of God, you should be immune from troubles that others face. You should have sort of a, a, an easy, comfortable journey, a flower-strewn pathway, and that there shouldn't be trials. And sometimes God's people get really depressed when they are facing troubles and trials in their lives. And they say, well, look, why is this happening? Why, why does God allow these things to come into my life? And yet, the Spirit of God says, man that is born of a woman, you're born of a woman, so am I, is of few days, and we are full of trouble. Yes, man is born unto trouble as the sparks try up, uh, fly upward. So therefore, what we notice here is this. There is the common lot of every man. The Lord Jesus Christ said, In this world ye shall have tribulation. And he was speaking to the children of God. But what I want you to notice in the psalm here, 37, is whilst we're acknowledging trouble, the Word of God says here in verse number 19, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Now, what is this that brings satisfaction to the child of God in the day of famine? What is the thing, my friend, that makes us not ashamed in the evil time? There has to be something that brings us that comfort in the midst of our tribulation, in the midst of our trials, that brings satisfaction to the child of God. And I suggest there are three things that brings satisfaction and ought to bring comfort to the child of God in the days of testing, in the days of trial, in the evil time, in the days of famine, that God's people will be satisfied. Let me give them to you. First of all, God remembers us. Look at verse number 18. The opening words of verse 18 says this, the Lord knoweth the days of the upright. The Lord knoweth. And that is the first thought, my friend, that ought to bring the child of God. You see the word knoweth. It's not that God has a general acquaintance with the days of the upright. There is an amazing familiarity here. God knoweth. Now what does God know about you and me that will help us in the days of trouble? There are billions of people in the world and looking down the generations. Why would God have a special interest in you and me? Or has God a special interest in you and me? The Word of God says, the Lord knoweth. Now what does God know that brings me comfort in such an evil time? Well, the first thing is this. It's a very simple thing. The Lord knows our labels. Now, I'm not talking about free Presbyterians. I'm talking about God knows your label. 
If you study the word of God, it says this in 2 Timothy verse, chapter 2, verse 19, the Lord knoweth them that are his. So the Lord knows you. If you're a child of God today, God knows you. God knows you. And I think that's an amazing thing that amidst all the billions of people in the world and the billions and billions and trillions of people that have ever lived, that the Word of God tells me that God knows me. Me. Insignificant. Nobody me. And yet the Word of God tells me that God remembers me. You know, some people feel so lonely in this world because they do not understand that there's anybody who cares about them or knows about them. It's just as if they were, didn't exist. I want to tell you, my brother, sister, never let the devil tell you that you're insignificant to God because God knows you. See, what does God know me? Listen, God knows your name. You read in the 10th chapter of the book of John's gospel, the story of the good shepherd and the sheep. And in John's gospel, chapter 10, the Bible tells us concerning the shepherd, it says this, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. He calleth his own sheep by name. And what that reminds us is you're not insignificant to God, then God knows your name. It says in the book of Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16, Behold, I have engraven thee upon the palms of my hands. Let me tell you, my friend, you're engraven upon the palms of your hand. You say to me, preacher, how can I be sure that God knows my individual name. I want to tell you, my friend, he does. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to his children and to his followers. And in verse number 20, he says this. He said, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your names are written in heaven. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ tells a story about the rich man and Lazarus. You notice that he never mentions the rich man's name, and yet society would have mentioned his and forgotten about the poor man's name. And I I never thought about it until one, I was preaching in a gospel campaign down in Bestbrook. And as I was standing preaching about it and was saying about the Lord knowing You know, that Lazarus, he calls Lazarus by name. Why? Because he knows his name. Because the Lord knew Lazarus' name. Because his name was engraved on the palms of his hands. His name was written in heaven. God knows his people by name. The rich man's name is not mentioned because God says concerning the wicked, he says, then shall I say to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. And my friends, I want to tell you, God remembers us. God knows your names. That's the first thought. Secondly, God remembers, God knows your limitations. In the Psalm 103, the Word of God tells me in the verse number 14, Psalm 103, verse 14, For he knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we are dust. God knows your limitations. And you know, when I think about that, listen, brother, sister, God doesn't put all those people just into a big lump or into a big pile and say, well, listen, they are my children. No, God knows your limitations. God knows how much you can take. I've heard people say to me, preacher, at times, you know, I just don't know how much I can take, how much more I can take. Have you ever said that? Whenever you've been in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trial, you've really felt that you've gone to 
the point of exhaustion, you've said to yourself, I just don't know how much more I can take. And friend, as you've said it, you've said it with a broken heart. And many times the tears have been running down your cheeks when you've said that. I want to tell you, brother, you may not know what you can take, but God does. God knows exactly what you can take. For God knows your limitations. God knows our frame. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says this, verse number 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God knows exactly what you can bear. And listen, if God is allowing you, brother or sister, if God's allowing you to go through that situation, God knows you're able to bear it. And God's providing for you the way of escape. When you come to the point when you just feel or that you cannot go on any further, I want to tell you, God not only knows how much you can take, but God provides the way of escape. God loves you. We had the we children's hymns true. Jesus loves me. And I tell you, my friend, Jesus loves me this morning. He knows my label. He knows my name. Praise God, he knows my limitations. He knows how much I can bear. In the Psalm 94, in verse number 16, we read these words, Psalm 94, verse 16. Who will rise up? For me against the evildoer? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Verse 22, but the Lord is my defense and my refuge is the rock or my God is the rock. Of my refuge. You see, Israel was in Egypt and was not able to get out of bondage until God provided the way of escape. And thank God, God provides the way of escape. And when we're in Egypt's bondage, I want to tell you listen, when we're in this old world and we're facing the trials and troubles, listen, don't be, a, don't be discouraged, brother. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. Look to him. He knows your limitations. Listen, remember what Jesus said. Without me, John 15, 5, without me you can do nothing. But what did Paul say in Philippians 4, 13? I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ that limiteth me. That that uh, help with me. So God will help us people. I can do all things through him that strengthens me. And so, brother, sister in Christ, he knows your label, he knows your limitations. Listen, something else. He remembers your longings. In Psalm 44, in verse number 21, Psalm 44, verse 21, it says this. Shall not God search... This out, for he knoweth, he knoweth the secrets of the heart. We haven't time to go into verses, but let me tell you, there's so many verses. Study it for yourself. What God knows about you. It says in Psalm 94, verse 11, he knoweth the thoughts of men. In John 2, verse 25, he knew what was in man. In Acts chapter 1, verse 24, the Lord which knoweth the hearts of all men. He knows your longings. I was thinking about that when we read this morning. John chapter 21. Remember when the Lord was examining Peter and the Lord was, you know, he, he blessed them by bringing the fish and fed them. Lord, the Lord didn't beat them over the head with the fish. Sometimes, you know, when people let us down, we just feel like beating them over the head with the fish. Or maybe a fish is too limp of itself. We'd beat them head over the head with a hammer. You know, we'd just like to get at them. Let me tell you, the Lord didn't beat the head of, the, of Peter. Let me tell you, he fed him. 
Those disciples that had gone back to the fishing, friend, through disappointment, Peter says, I go a-fishing. He says, we go with thee. And the Lord Jesus Christ, whenever they came, friend, let me tell you, and the Lord Jesus directed those big fish into the net, but praise God, although there were 153, the net didn't break. God was able to keep the last one on the net. And he says, bring in your catch. And the Lord says, have you any meat? The Lord fed them. And then the, the Lord spoke to Peter, who denied him, and he said this to Peter. He said, Peter, and I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ looked down at the fish, because that was Peter's old life, because he was a fisherman. And they asked Peter a very searching question. He says, Peter, do you love me more than you love these? Peter said to him, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Peter, feed my lambs. And then he said, Peter, do you really love me more than these? He said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, Peter, feed my sheep. Then he asked him a third time. You see, Peter denied the Lord three times. And the Bible tells us that Peter was grieved. You know, when Peter denied the Lord the third time, and Peter was standing in that judgment hall, the Lord Jesus looked at Peter. The Lord's heart was breaking. And Peter saw those tear-dimmed eyes of the Savior in that judgment hall. And the Bible says Peter went out into the net night and he wept bitterly. Peter denied the Lord three times. Now the Lord Jesus makes him confess three times. And Peter was grieved. And this is what Peter said to the Lord. He says, Lord, thou knowest all things. You know all. And friend, the Lord does. The Lord knows all. He knows your label. He knows your limitation. He knows your longings. He knows the longings in your heart. He knows what's going on inside today. What you're longing for. What your desires Yes, thou knowest all things. And then Psalm 139. And in the opening verse of Psalm 139, it says this. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Friend, he knows our down sitting. He knows our upright. He knows our living. He knows our living. He knows the life that you're living. We haven't time to go into this this morning, but listen. He knows our attitudes. He knows our anxieties. He knows our actions. Lord, you know my down sitting. Lord, you know my uprising. Lord, you know me altogether. And the first thing that I believe that blesses the heart of the child of God, and that's Psalm 37, it says this, The Lord knoweth the days of the right. That's the first thought. The second thought is this. Not only does the Lord remember us, but the Lord rewards us. It says in verse 18, not only does the Lord know the days of the upright, but it says, and their inheritance shall be forever. Their inheritance 
shall be forever. In Psalm 16 and the verse 5 it says, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance. When I think about that, the Lord rewards us. He rewards us with his presence. The Lord is the portion. The Lord's the portion. You know, whenever we think about inheritance, we think about money. Or we think about land. Or we think about houses. That's what we would call inheritance. At least that would hope our inheritance would be. Sometimes we get disappointed. Let me tell you, friend, listen. You will never be disappointed with the Lord because the Lord rewards every one of his children. And the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance. You have the Lord. You have the Lord. And when David was saying that in Psalm 16, verse 5, remember this. David was excluded by Saul's watchdogs from sharing in the family inheritance. Each family in Israel had its, its territory assigned to them by lot. Remember, by, by, by Joshua, they were given their lots by Joshua in the original division of the land of Canaan among the tribes. But as long as Saul was on the throne, David couldn't enjoy his inheritance in the fields of Bethlehem. You know what David said? Never mind. I may never experience the inheritance of my lot in the field of Bethlehem, but I have the Lord. The Lord's my inheritance. Let me ask you, are you satisfied with the Lord this morning? Are you satisfied in knowing the Lord? I was just reading afresh the story of King George VI, Queen's father. And he was... The Queen's father was a born-again believer. And King George VI was invited to go to to Canada. But he, before he became king, he used to go to a little assembly of God's people, to the weekly Bible readings, where God's people met together in London. But in the course of his duty, when he became king, he, he, he went to Canada, to British Columbia, And it was thought by the Canadian officials that George VI might like to meet one of the native-born Indian chiefs. A well-known and influential chief was called Chief Whitefeather. And so they met together, and the chief was told to sing before the king. Chief Whitefeather started to sing before the king of the great empire, British empire. And he sang, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather be his than of riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses of land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be a king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. And the officials were stunned. And they wondered what the reaction of King George VI would be. And when he finished, the king walked over to the Indian chief and he took him by the hand. And this is what he said. I'd rather have Jesus too. I'd rather have Jesus too. Friends, let me ask you this. Is the Lord Jesus number one in your life? Should you lose everything else? Are you satisfied with Jesus? The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance. What did the Lord say in Genesis chapter 15 to Abram. He said this, 
Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. God's presence with us. You see, everything belongs to him. And therefore, we have everything we need in him. For my God shall supply all your need. Listen to me carefully, friend. When we think about an inheritance, we think about things. It's not necessarily the gifts of God, but it's the God of gifts, the giver. And thank God we'll be satisfied in him. All I need, all I need is in Christ. Jesus knows all about my struggles. He will guide to the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. He rewards us with his presence. Secondly, he rewards us with his promises. Psalm 119, verse 111. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever. For they are the rejoicing of my heart. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever. Psalm, 100 and, or Psalm 119, verse 103. It says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to be my mouth. Verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, is a light unto my path. Verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. That's an inheritance. You know why? Because heaven and earth shall pass away, says the word of God, but my word shall never pass away. God's word is forever settled in heaven. There's 1 Peter 1.25 says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. We have his promises. We have his presence. We have his pity. In Psalm 116, in verse number 1, Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. I love the Lord. You know, David's love for the Lord was in response to God's love for David. I love the Lord. Friend, this morning, do you love him? Is the Lord your inheritance? Is the Lord your rich reward? But very quickly, verse, let's go back to Psalm 37. Time's away. Verse 19. I said there were three things. He remembers us. Praise God when I know that God remembers me. My, that gives me joy, satisfaction in heart. He rewards me because he's my inheritance forever. And then, thank God, he reassures me. Look at verse 19. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. See that word, ashamed? There are two thoughts there. The thought, first of all, ashamed, carries the thought of embarrassment. Embarrassment. Because... In olden days, what they used to do, whenever soldiers were captured, you know what they'd do? They would parade them through the streets to humiliate them, to embarrass them, to shame them. To shame them. But thank God, it says, in the days of famine, or sorry, in the evil time, will not be ashamed. 
Thank God there's no embarrassment with the Lord. But there's another thought. Embarrassment. There's disappointment. You know, when things don't turn out as we expect, sometimes we feel ashamed. You know, thank God in our trials and our troubles, we know that God won't shame his children. He'll not let us down. God won't fail his word. And maybe the devil says to you, but listen, where's the fulfillment of the promise? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You and I have got to wait on God, friend, and I'll tell you, we shall not be ashamed. Listen, we'll not be ashamed in the timing, notice, in the evil day. I think it's an interesting thought. It says this, they shall not be ashamed in the evil day. You know, God's help for his children is not before or after, but notice the word, in, in the evil day. There's that little verse in God's Word that says, My grace is sufficient. Now, it didn't say, My grace will be sufficient. It doesn't say, My grace has been sufficient. It says, My grace is sufficient. Why? Because, friend, listen, God's grace is just sufficient, just as you need it. It always is. Present tense. Is. We sang our opening psalm this morning. God is our refuge and our strength. Listen to the next words. A present help in the time of trouble. A present help. And so the word of God says here, they shall not be ashamed in, in the evil time. You see, when we seek help from others, we often have to wait for it to come. Maybe they're away. Maybe they're doing something else. You've got to wait for help to come. Listen, God's aid for his children is never too early and it's never too late. He's all on time. In just as you need in the evil day. Thank God you'll never be ashamed. Do you remember Mary and Martha? What did they say, Lord? If only you'd come, Lord. <laughs> if only you'd come, my brother wouldn't have died. Was the Lord late? Too late? No, friend, he wasn't. He was dead on time. That he would be glorified in the raising of Lazarus. And thank God there's not only the timing, there's the triumph. It says they shall not be ashamed. Listen, God will provide beyond our expectation. And we haven't time to go into it, but it says, but the wicked. But the wicked. There's the contrast. But the wicked. But the wicked shall perish. And friend, the day is coming when the wicked shall be ashamed. They'll be embarrassed and stand in shame at the throne of God to hear from the lips of a holy Savior upon the throne, depart from me, I never knew you. And the arresting angels will take them to cast them into hell. And they'll be paraded off to the damned, to outer darkness. They'll be ashamed. They'll be disappointed. For everything that they had has come to nothing. But God's children shall not be ashamed, even at his coming. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word today. And I pray that Thou will bless Thy Word to all our hearts. We, we thank You, Lord, that Thou art upon the throne. And Lord, we bless Thee that 
neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, no matter how dark they are, or things to come, no matter how great the trial, shall be able to separate me from the love of God. And Lord, we thank thee that thou art our inheritance, and we thank thee that we have all in Christ. We have eternal life, will never perish. None shall pluck us out of your hand and will not be ashamed. O oh God, help me to live today. Help me to live every day that I may not be ashamed at his coming or his call. Just ready to meet the Lord. Save the lost. Restore the fallen and bless your saints. For Jesus' sake. Amen.